At one point in time, Jordan Peterson was a well-respected clinical psychologist. His work and research analyzing different aspects of personality were studied internationally. With over 100 published peer review articles, he was renowned as one of the utmost experts on personality, politics, and all cognitive psychology. But suddenly in 2016, everything seemed to change. The once respected psychologist was now appearing on news streams, videos, and his own YouTube channel. His past calm and mostly academic type demeanor seemed to shift rapidly into anger and contempt. So what happened that made him so mad? Well, Canada passed Bill C-16, which added the words gender identity or expression to the existing legislation protecting people from discrimination. Basically, the new legislation protected people from discrimination by others like work or school based on their gender identity. It also added gender identity to the list of attributes that can be included when charging a hate crime. And that's it. But to Jordan Peterson, this was evidently the end of the world, the collapse of society and the first of the four horses. Peterson almost immediately began to appear leading protests on the University of Toronto campus centered around the idea of freedom of speech. With Bill C-16 and surrounding legislation, it's the first time I've seen in our legislative history where people are attempting to make us speak their language. As Peterson drones on and on and on about the importance of free speech, chaos seems to unfold around him anti-protesters who had brought white noise machines had them kicked down by a man yelling, this man is brilliant. Meanwhile, one rally attendee yelled, we need more Michael Browns. The scene seemed to unravel with pushing and shoving in the crowd quickly and multiple people being separated by campus police. When asked how he felt about far-right people appearing at a rally that he organized, Peterson responded by saying, it doesn't surprise me. All of this agitation and noise risks making the right rise. It's all happening. And why would that be surprising? For the first time in my life, I'm seeing young men turn to the right. It's not good. And there are people called out of the woodwork that you seriously don't want to meet. Not for one moment did Peterson seem concerned that it was his rhetoric bringing these people out. That seemed to escape his thought process. And as time has gone on, he is still missing this point. While some of the stories about him seem outright ridiculous, like his apparent all meat diet, others like his verbal support, or at least understanding of Russia's decision to invade Ukraine are downright terrifying. So what happened here? And how did an extremely successful and respected professor become a leading voice to incel and far-right people and communities? I don't speak perfectly, and my arguments aren't perfectly formulated, and neither are anyone else's. Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be discussing the ever-controversial, mind-boggling Jordan Peterson. And listen, before we get started, I do want to make everyone aware that this is just some of the stuff about him. And I say some because this man has quite the list of things we could talk about with many twists and turns and covering it all would take hours. Now, before he was proclaimed a hero to the incel community by Olivia Wilde, which I know her controversies, I will get into that on a different day. But before that, Jordan Peterson was just your average everyday professor. He was actually well-respected in the academic psychology community. And really, unless you were in that community, you likely never heard of him. But now after he became an internet sensation with over 5 million subscribers, appeared on every right-wing news show known to man and been banned from Twitter for misgendering and dead naming Elliot Page, you've probably heard more of him than you would prefer. It all started back in 2016 with the passage of Canada's C-16 bill. Suddenly he was everywhere and the rally was just the beginning of it. YouTube was how he got his big start because if you scroll back years, all you'll find is some horribly shot footage of boring, normal run of the mill psychology lectures. But then you get to 2016 and there you'll find the beginning of the end with a video called Professor Against Political Correctness, part one. 
The video starts off with a bang, with Peterson claiming that Marxists, which in my estimation, by the way, is no better than identifying as Nazis. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, falling in line with a certain theoretical theory and falling in line with a group of people that murdered millions of people is definitely not the same thing. The three-part series goes on and on about what he calls PC extremists and comes with detailed slideshows and even what he calls a game to fight against this new politically correct world. Basically, all of this boils down to one thing. Jordan Peterson was uncomfortable with the requirement that he should be addressing people with their preferred pronouns and blamed the fact that he was now asked to do this on, of course, radical leftist activists. So. Does any of this sound familiar to anyone? Because I'm hearing some dog whistles here. Now, the three-part series would set the stage for the rallies to come, and soon, Jordan Peterson's media firestorm. This was it. He was now a leader of the free speech activists pushing against protections for gender inclusion, freedom, and pronouns, and he was by no means apologetic about it. To Jordan, Bill C-16, which once again merely put gender identity into a protected group in Canada's human rights laws, was a step towards authoritarian government. He also made some claims that the bill would be separating families, which it wouldn't, but I'm mostly going to focus on dispelling the myth that his true concern was just about freedom of speech. And maybe for just a second, you can actually understand what he's saying. He doesn't believe the government should have a part in determining how people speak. And that I can understand. Free speech is a thing. Limiting speech is dangerous. And that's at least relatively reasonable. But just consider for a second that maybe the government wouldn't have to make all these anti-discrimination laws if people were actually considerate of each other. It's not a chicken before the egg situation. People are being discriminated against, so the government makes laws to protect them. It's not the other way around. But if you dig just a little bit deeper into what he's really saying, his true feelings become crystal clear because his problem isn't that the government is now involved in speech. His problem is that he doesn't agree with or understand the gender spectrum. He doesn't agree with the idea of gender identity as a whole. That's his real problem, not the government. According to him, terms like gender identity and gender expression are apparently propositions of radical social constructionists that are being used to bully opponents into submission. In various interviews, he claims that the new language surrounding gender is dangerous because it's not naturally occurring. This is stuff that's being made up, as is the existence of non-binary people in general, apparently. But historically speaking, Jordan's wrong. The existence of non-binary people or multiple different genders other than the binary, male and female in Western culture, and the words used to describe them have existed for centuries. In fact, in many cultures across the globe, sex has been considered one thing while gender is another. This isn't really new. It's just apparently new for people in Western cultures. That doesn't mean that it's not naturally occurring though. And that's the part that Jordan seems to miss repeatedly through his nonsensical lectures and interviews. But as per usual, it gets a little bit deeper than that. In one interview, when asked if he would refer to people by their preferred pronouns, Jordan Peterson claims that it would depend on the circumstances because to him, pronouns are not a form of identity. They are something different. Sometimes when people ask someone to call them by their preferred pronouns, it would be a quote, Is that just a narcissistic power play? Which I just don't understand. Is it narcissistic to prefer to not be insulted? We all have preferred adjectives like not wanting to be called ugly or stupid or ways we just wouldn't want to be addressed. And this is just one of those ways. So listen, Jordan, Jordy Poo, can I call you that? All right, Jordy Poo. People are not trying to trick you into some weird radical world where they control everything you say and do. People just wanna be called what makes them feel most comfortable and they just wanna be respected. It really doesn't have to be this big nothing burger. It just boils down to kindness and that's it. I understand when he says he doesn't understand, and that's okay. It's okay to not understand the inner workings of gender identity and expression, but people aren't asking you to understand. They're simply asking people to be respectful of their identity, of who they are. As his colleague says, if you actually listen and you parse out the arguments, it becomes very clear that this is not about freedom of speech, that this is about reducing transgendered people's needs as excessive and illegitimate. And 
that's it. That's really what it boils down to. But either way, whether you truly believe that he's just against putting gender identity into the protected groups category, or that he actually is transphobic, his words resonated with all the very people he claims to be against. With the passage of one simple bill and through the use of a few very long videos, Jordan Peterson was now a star and oh boy, he ran with it. Now he wasn't the boring stuffy professor. He was a well-known guru rallying against identity politics and he was going to be making some money off that persona. Soon, it wasn't just transgender or non-binary people that he was rallying against. It was everyone, or at least, everyone who wasn't a straight, white, cis male. If you're a man and you're trying to embody productive order, let's say, and you make an advance on a woman, the feminine, you make an advance on the feminine, then we'll say archetypally, and you're rejected, then that interjects a tremendous amount of chaos into your existence. As Peterson continued to amass a massive following and shock people around the world with his antics when appearing on a wide variety of shows, he decided to take his rise to fame one step forward by writing a book. 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos quickly became an international bestseller. The supposed self-help book takes 12 simple rules for living, including tell the truth, or at least don't lie, and stand up straight with your shoulders straight, and breaks them down using psychological, religious, and philosophical principles. And it sure seems simple enough. I'm sure nothing could go terribly wrong here, right? Well, about that. Remember the whole Jordan doesn't believe in gender identity thing? Well, he sure as hell believes in personality traits being associated with certain genders. And not because of, you know, society placing certain rules on gender norms, but just because they're apparently inherent to specific genders. In his eyes, there is a crisis in masculinity and his book and YouTube videos are here to save the day. Well, by golly gosh. Now, for some, this came with raving reviews, but for others, it only amplified their opinion that Jordan Peterson might just be a tiny bit sexist. Some critics have called the book and his other work simplistic, pseudoscientific, alarmist, and at times conspiratorial. And I couldn't have really said it any better. Order is masculine, he claims, and chaos is feminine. Society should be run as a patriarchal structure because men are just built to run things better. According to him, women are just naturally more agreeable, more prone to avoiding conflict. And men, on the other hand, they've got this. They have all the necessary personality traits for leadership, apparently. I get the vibes of the whole women are from Venus, men are from Mars, which, To be fair, that used to be the science, but science has evolved and these personality traits by gender have been found to be far less about biology and far more about society, an idea that good old Jordy boy just can't seem to wrap his head around. More recent studies have found that when we ask people about their personalities using measuring tools that account for implicit bias, otherwise known as biases that we don't even know we have, the supposed differences that Jordan finds to be so astronomical between genders were actually much, much smaller. Sure, science is relatively in agreement that some personality traits differ based on gender, but it's not nearly as big of a difference as previously thought. Like literally those differences are so small that they barely exist. And in some studies, these differences are so small that they're just seen as margin of error. But I digress, back to Jordy Poo. According to Peterson and his book, the shift from a patriarchal society to a more equitable one has led to a catastrophic and detrimental amount of male suffering. They can't fulfill their roles apparently. And of course, they're lonely. In an interview with the New York Times, Jordan is asked about Alex Minnesian, a man who drove through Toronto killing 10 people. Alex was apparently a self-proclaimed incel. And what did Jordan Peterson think about this man? Well, he thought that Violent attacks are what happen when men do not have partners and society had to find them partners to make sure this didn't happen again. And I'm sorry, but what? So we're really gonna say, and by we, I mean Jordan Peterson, is going to say that it's women's fault that a man killed 10 people because he was a lonely boy. I've been lonely at times in my life too, but I've never thought about killing people because of it. And I find that really interesting that you would actually make the equation or to equate that loneliness in men is going to cause violence, but then try to turn it around on women. 
because you're kind of proving a point that you're kind of saying men are inherently violent unless they have something to distract them, in which case I'm referring to the distraction being a woman. So tell me again how if someone is bored that they're gonna choose to be violent, how that person in your theoretical world is gonna make a better leader. Wouldn't you want someone who's more level-headed? I know I would, but that's just me trying to play around in Jordan Peterson's little nonsensical world. But that's apparently what Jordan is insinuating and his way to fix the issue is equally as terrifying because here's what he believes. He was angry at God because women were rejecting him. The cure for that is enforced monogamy. That's actually why monogamy emerges. Now, Jordi Poo goes on to explain that enforced monogamy was needed because otherwise women would only pick high status men and then no one's happy. Half the men fail and no one cares about the men who fail. So yeah, in a weird twist of events, forced monogamy is apparently what's going to save men. And that doesn't sound like it could have disastrous consequences at all or I don't know, put women in hyper dangerous situations. But what do you expect from a man that found absolutely nothing wrong with marriages in the 1950s where women were often barred from working, making money or buying anything for themselves? To him, anyone who complained about that way of living was just whiny, particularly Betty Friedan, who wrote what has become known as the feminist manifesto, The Feminine Mystique. Apparently, women in the 1950s had comfortable, secure lives because yeah, we're just going to ignore the mountains of evidence that women were horribly abused at astronomical numbers back then. Anyone that complained was apparently just bored. He says, it's like Jesus get a hobby for Christ's sake. So yes, great solution to not being able to work and having your entire life controlled by another person. Thank you so much. Now, when he isn't talking about forced monogamy or just the terrible life of incels that we should feel so bad for, he's trying to convince us to feel bad for the people that sexually harass women, because to him, we should also have some sympathy. It's not their fault. And that's right, babes, it's that damn makeup. Because in an interview discussing sexual harassment in the workplace, Jordan Peterson says that men and women can't feasibly work together. Not only does he say that, but he says it will take more than 40 years for men and women to be able to work together without sexual harassment. When asked about a solution, he says, Like what? Here's a rule. Don't, don't How about you... no makeup in the workplace? Because it is, quote, sexually provocative. He continues on to say that women wear lipstick, and I really wish I was kidding for what I'm about to say, but dead serious. He claims that women wear lipstick because lips turn red during sex. So it means that she's aroused by the male's presence or wants him to be aroused by hers. I'm sorry. I really tried to say that with a straight face. You have no idea how many times I had to record that line. I just said, fuck it. I'm just going to kind of smile and laugh through this because it's, it's so absurd. Basically, his comments amount to if a woman wears makeup or even high heels in the workplace and then gets sexually harassed, that she asked for it. And there it is, the dreaded, she asked for it. Now, this unfortunate list goes on and on for Jordan about how feminism, women gaining more equality or freedom and sexual choice has been detrimental to men. But as it turns out, it's not just gender equality that Jordan seems to despise, it's racial too. Yeah, who would have ever guessed? It is much harder to actually deal with the fact of the sometimes unjust distribution of privileges and resources in a complex society than to kowtow to radicals who know how to viciously accuse, weaponize guilt and claim through manipulative sloganeering the moral upper hand. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's critical race theory. And it's coming for us. Just kidding, we're, we're all gonna be okay. But to some people, I don't know, like Jordan Peterson, critical race theory is a very spooky thing. First off, let me just break down CRT for some of you that may just know it as the super scary way of teaching American history to <gasps> your children. But here's what it really breaks down to. Critical race theory is usually a high level class usually taught in law school or maybe other graduate programs that explore how the law, political movements, media, and other social structures are shaped by race and ethnicity. In fact, 99% of the time, critical race theory puts the most emphasis on the outcomes of racism in social structures, not on individual people. So the whole they're telling white kids they're racist thing is kind of bullshit. 
to Jordan and many others like Christopher Rufo who appeared on Jordan Peterson's YouTube channel, critical race theory is very dangerous. This became readily apparent when Peterson came out with yet another YouTube video debating a new law in Canada. This time, it was Bill 67, which addressed racial inequality in Canadian schools by requiring racial equity training and allowing for repercussions against a person who disrupts or attempts to disrupt proceedings of a school or class through the use of racist language or activities. Now, that seems pretty simple, but to Jordan, it was so much more than that because isn't it always? A warning to citizens of Ontario and Canada, Bill 67, which purports to be nothing but an anti-racist bill, is in fact the most pernicious and dangerous piece of legislation that any Canadian government has attempted to put forward. That's the beginning of the letter that he wrote to his fans, and of course, the nation of Canada regarding the new bill. The five minute YouTube video goes on to dispel the same myths that we hear about critical race theory over and over. It claims it's a radical leftist doctrine which strips anyone who is white of any innocence. Basically, Jordan Peterson did his typical thing, used big words and fancy academic leaning rhetoric to say the same thing that people on the alt or light right have been saying all along. He just made it sound a little prettier. But it's really not shocking that he would be adamantly against any bill that accounts for racism in schools and pushes towards training in anti-racism, considering what he's said about things like it in the past. I mean, to him, white privilege is a Marxist lie. And considering how he feels about Marxism, that makes the idea inherently dangerous, at least in his eyes. Now, white privilege doesn't mean you got everything perfect in your life just because you're white or that your life can't be hard as a white person. It just means that you haven't been systematically stopped from getting things or experienced horrific treatment from society because of your skin color. That's literally, that's it. Then there's the video with Christopher Rufo, who you may know as one of the key people in the anti-CRT movement in the United States. It's one hour and 30 minutes long, by the way. And through their conversation, Christopher discusses the background of critical race theory, which he says started out with Derek Bell's identity politics and radical, radicalized theory that they plan to implement in any and all structures. Now, of course, Rufo reinforces Peterson's idea that critical race theory is that every radical leftist way of thinking and it's heading towards one key goal, limiting free speech. In fact, Rufo says theorists are calling for a specific state government to enforce speech limitations. At least they do admit that these things are not totally bogus. People have rationalized horrific treatment of groups and oppression to keep power. And there is definitely a history of racial injustice, but it's just not that simple apparently. According to Christopher Rufo, it's not fair to look at the institutions of the United States through the lens of oppression because we have apparently taken steps to make it better. He then goes on to list the Declaration of Independence as a thing that apparently made things better in terms of addressing racial inequality. You know, the one written by Thomas Jefferson who owned multiple slaves and didn't consider black people to be people. I don't think that's the step forward you think it is. Obviously, I don't have all the time in the world to sit here and discuss in extremely specific detail all of this, but it will be in my source list if you wanna take a look for yourself. Now. Over and over, Jordan Peterson has attacked any term that he believes to be developed by the so-called radical left and seems to lack a deep understanding of society or the theories themselves. But that doesn't stop people from listening to and following him. And the type of followers he seems to attract have certainly raised more than a few eyebrows. For the record, I don't actually think Jordan Peterson is all right. And neither do I believe he himself could be considered an incel. Do I think that he has become a dangerous pipeline for people to find these groups and resonate with them? Yes. And do I think that he has given a certain sense of confirmation to these groups? Absolutely, I do. And I'm not the only one. David Niewert, author of Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump wrote, it's true that he's not a white nationalist, but he's buttressing his narrative with pseudo facts, many of them created for the explicit purpose of promoting white nationalism especially with the whole notion of cultural Marxism. The arc of radicalization often passes through these more moderate ideologues. So yeah, just because you're not technically part of the group doesn't mean you don't have the same issues happening. 
Using their rhetoric is still awful, and Peterson has been doing this more and more as time has gone on. But beyond his transphobia, sexism, and apparent misunderstanding of racial inequity, there's something else more recently that's also caught the public's eye, Jordan's comments about Russia. And before we take a look at his apparent approval of the Russian invasion against Ukraine, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. So hello, it is I doing an ad read for myself. In case you are unaware, I am doing a very sudden flash sale on my merch site, which I know I I don't really talk about it too often, but I do in fact have merch. It's multilevelmerch.shop. It'll be in the description box if you'd like to check it out. Use code DARKDIVES to go ahead and receive, I think it's 25% off the entire site. I'm gonna be taking the site down for about a month after this sale ends so that I can revamp it and get some new designs up there and just kind of change the overall look and feel. So again, make sure to go to multilevelmerch.shop and go ahead and use code DARKDIVES to get, I believe it's 25% off your entire order. And this little flash sale of mine ends this Saturday. So um, make sure to get it while it's hot, I guess. That is so tacky to say, sorry about that. This episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now, as the pandemic has continued to rage on, and if you can believe it, we're almost in year three of the pandemic, which is so unpleasant to know. But with that came the rise of shopping online, and with that, a need for a new way to coupon, and that's where Honey steps in because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones it finds to your cart. Recently, I've been cleaning out my closet since I'm not a spring cleaner, but I'm a fall cleaner because fall and winter are the better seasons for fashion anyway. So I've been donating a lot of the clothing that I don't want anymore, and therefore I would like a few new sweaters. And thanks to Honey, on a recent purchase, I actually got a 15% off coupon and a 15% off is better than no percent off, and I am happy all the same. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. You just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something that I don't use. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com casket. That's joinhoney.com slash casket. And are we degenerate in a profoundly threatening manner? I think the answer to that may well be yes. The idea that we are ensconced in a culture war has become a rhetorical commonplace. How serious is that war? Is it serious enough to increase the probability that Russia say will be motivated to invade and potentially incapacitate Ukraine merely to keep the pathological West out of that country, which is a key part of the historically Russian sphere of influence. The culture has leapt from the depths of social media echo chambers and cable television and has finally led to the extremely serious consequences that Jordan has been warning us about, at least according to him. February 24th, 2022 is the day that most of us will remember as the day that Russia started a large scale invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine. While many reacted with shock and almost immediate disapproval of Vladimir Putin's decision and watched horrified as hospitals, schools, and civilian homes were destroyed, others had a different reaction. So back to Jordan Peterson's YouTube channel we go. Now he starts off fine saying that he finds Putin's actions to be unconscionable but he quickly veers onto a new path. Sure, Russia is wrong, but he seems to sympathize with why Russia might be invading Ukraine. This reason, he says, is because of the overwhelming degeneracy of the West and Russia's desperation to return to orthodox beliefs. Our apparent degeneration has made Putin and the Russian people wary of us and is what he used to gain support for the invasion of Ukraine. But are we degenerate, asked Peterson. Yes, he says, we are. And how does he explain this? Well, by bringing up the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson and claiming that she was nominated for sex and race over her qualifications. Sure, she was qualified, he says, but who she was trumped her background. Clearly, this was pandering by the Biden administration to the woke culture and proof of American degeneracy. 
So yes, we are degenerate because we celebrate the historic nomination of the first black woman to the Supreme Court and her confirmation. He goes on to word vomit his common bullshit about how everyone on the left is radical and looking to destroy capitalism. Same old, same old. But is this an excuse for Putin? Not necessarily, but to him, it is the reason. Russia is merely defending itself from the degenerate West by invading a sovereign nation. He believes the war is a symptom of a problem, not the problem itself. As David French says in The Atlantic, while the West has problems, it is not degenerate by any reasonable historical measure. And there is no reasonable comparison between the virtue of NATO and Russia. Obviously, the West is not perfect, but saying that the West has become so insane that a country statistically less religious, less free, and more dangerous felt the need to invade a sovereign nation to protect itself is laughable. The question of whether countries like Canada or America are lacking the moral high ground to speak out against this is also laughable in terms of what Peterson laid out. If you want to talk about the morality of the United States, talk about our history of invading sovereign nations or the criminal justice system, or the fact that we are one of the only developed countries in the world without mandatory paid parental leave, not about how we engage in identity politics. That's a non-starter. But hey, for Peterson, this was his way to prove that everything he'd been saying all along was right. He always claimed identity politics would lead to disaster, and this was his way of showing that his prediction just might be coming true. So of course, he saw the chance to jump, and he did right off a fucking cliff. Of course, these types of comments are deeply concerning as it lends to undermining the United States' support of Ukraine and paints the country and other countries in the West of having no authority to condemn the horrific war crimes carried out by Putin. For Peterson though, it's just par for the course. Over the years, his lectures, predictions, and just all around rhetoric have become increasingly more upsetting. And what's even worse is that people are listening to him. He has over 5 million followers on YouTube. He has joined the ranks of Ben Shapiro and others as some of the most influential people on the right. And he's even sponsored now by The Daily Wire. According to him, he isn't thrilled by his growing popularity with dangerous crowds, but that's certainly not what it seems like. To me, he seems like a man that got his 15 minutes of fame and became addicted. Certainly he is making more money now than he ever did in the world of academia and speaking to a wider audience than he ever could have imagined. What's that old saying again? What is it? Power corrupts completely, something like that. Well, that sure as hell seems like what's happening here. And despite his constant rambling of pseudoscientific bullshit, people are listening and his power and influence just keeps growing. As the Guardian puts it, Peterson's wave is unlikely to come crashing down anytime soon. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I do appreciate your time here with me today, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. So goodbye for now.